Hello, my beautiful plant people. How are we today? For those who have never met me before, I am Sam. I'm from Plant Collector Melbourne. And today we have a video all about winter because it is getting pretty chilly in Melbourne. And let's be honest, me and the plants are quite cold, which is why I'm wearing this rugged up thing today. Um, but yes, it's not even sunny today. It is very cloudy, typical Melbourne because it was sunny before and now it is cloudy. But today we are going to be talking about so many different things in regards to plants in winter and care. But before I get started, let me do a little bit of a disclaimer because my conditions in Melbourne are very different to wherever you are. Um, or has the potential to be different to where you are. And not only that, but the way that we grow is very different. So for example, in the store, um, I do indoor conditions, but at home I have a greenhouse and they are substantially different in the way that I do their care. Uh, so whether you are in a grow tent or a greenhouse or indoors or outdoor, if you're lucky enough to have beautiful humidity and warmth, um, then we are going to have different pressures. We are going to have different care needs. So just keep that in mind while I am saying all of my tips and tricks for you. So today we're gonna to be talking about a plethora of things and it's all to do with winter, whether that is light, watering, uh, feeding, um, pathogens such as bacterial or fungal infections. We're gonna be talking about all of that good good. I've got notes on my phone so that I don't miss anything for you. But essentially, let's get started. Where is my phone? It's in my pocket. Ta-da! And I got a new phone, thank goodness. I think my old phone was about five years old and it was definitely time to get a new one. And all of my friends, all the PCM crew were very, uh, let's just say passionate about me getting a new phone and very passionate about me putting a safety thing on it as well. But anyway, <laughs> ah, can you tell that I don't mind? Anyway, so let me get up my notes. Now, the first thing, let us talk about light. So when it comes to winter, not only is light going to be um, lesser in duration um, and lesser in intensity. So in saying that, you will, you will probably experience the plants going to slow down. Um, so there's a couple of things that we can do. We can do some lighting that is supplementary. So you can do some grow lights if you need. Um, I personally, for my greenhouse, uh, during this time in winter, I actually remove the shade cloth. So depending on where you are, um, you can or cannot do that. I know some of my friends don't like doing this during winter because um, it's almost just too hard basket for them. So um, some greenhouses is actually like built in um, and stable and to take it off requires a lot of energy and effort. But for me, when I built my greenhouse, I actually made sure that it could be easily taken on and off just for winter purposes. Um, so luckily I only have one shade cloth, but I do know a lot of my friends have multiple layers. So depending on your effort, um, you can or cannot do that. So for those of you that are indoor, or even this could apply, for if you've got a greenhouse as well, is that you can start to move plants around. So that's like one of my easiest solutions for you. So instead of buying um, something new, you can simply just grab a plant and put it closer to a window where it's getting more light um, or where that is warmer. Um, there's also a reminder that plants don't like extremes. They don't like extreme cold, they don't like extreme heat. So try not to put it too close to the heater, otherwise they will burn or dry up way too fast. Um, and if they are close to a window and they are experiencing drafts, I would highly recommend moving those as well. So that is just some things to think about in winter is that um, because we have less light, um, you might want to move them accordingly. And then when it starts to warm up again, we can move it back. Um, of course, if you have a grow tent and let's say that you are using lights, I feel like majority of people that have grow tents because it is a artificial environment where you are controlling everything, um, I don't think a lot of this will apply to you because the conditions will stay the same regardless, um, which is the beautiful thing about grow tents. So that might not, um, in terms of light, change anything for people that grow in tents. 
And when we're talking about watering, because in the same token that your plants are slowing down because there is less light, you need to water less because the plants are photosynthesizing less, which means that they need water less. Um, they're also going to be drying out slower. So if you overdo it, your chances are that you might get some root rot. Um, so I always get this wrong. I wouldn't say wrong. I always um, forget this every single year. And it's that once the temperature starts to drop and it starts to head into winter, is that I forget to change my schedule um, for less. So, It'll be that um, that transition um, into winter, I'll start to see yellow leaves um, and that will give me a really good indication like, hey, Sam, it's time to slow down on the watering because it is starting to get to winter. So speaking about leaves, let's talk about maintenance. When we're talking about maintenance, this is more just like the chopping off of dead leaves, whether they are yellow, whether they are brown, whether they're infected. Um, so if you've got yellow leaves, um, particularly if the older leaves are going yellow um, quickly and like the whole leaf, that's when you know that you're probably over watering. Um, my favorite thing to tell people is that what's the difference um, or how can you tell over and under watering? So over watering is more mushy, more yellow, the leaves go quickly um, and like plants start to go limp. Underwatering is more browning and crispy and crunchy and dry. So um, those are the two kind of indications of whether you're under or over watering. Um, so when it comes to maintenance, you will experience um, more yellow leaves during winter. And that might just be because you're adjusting to the watering schedule as like me, um, but just chopping those off. Uh, and then even if you've got any infected leaves, so if you've got a bacterial or fungal infection, it is very common, especially during winter. So maintenance wise, cut all those leaves off. Um, and a lot of people ask me when to cut off the leaves. So it's not like it's a hard and fast rule that when to chop off a leaf. Uh, for me in particular, I guess when I was younger, I think I like to think that the leaves, as soon as it was like over 50% yellow or brown, I would cut it off. Um, but nowadays, I think that I just cut it, um, I, my threshold is a lot lower. That might just be that the leaf has a tear or there's a little bit of um, yellowing, fungal, bacterial infection, and I will cut it off straight away. Um, and my reasoning for this is because when I was helping collectors up um, north and in Cairns, um, they actually were ruthless. <laughs> they would just cut all, um, any leaf that looked a little bit off, um, yellow, brown, they would just cut it off. Uh, one of the beautiful collectors told me that the reason why they do it is because then the plant can focus on growing its newer leaves instead of putting the energy into that particular leaf. Like we all like the idea of perfection and that might play into it as well. But in terms of health of the plant, um, they can focus on the newer leaves as well. So nowadays I'm just like, if I'm not in love with the leaf, um, I will cut it off. I feel like there's a lot of noise. Like I feel like a lot of people say all these different things. Um, and now that I have experienced at least five different winters, I now know that um, from my early journey is that I didn't actually like to fertilize during winter. And that was mostly coming from like a fear-based decision because I, the way that I thought of it in my mind is that if I over fertilize, um, then I'll kill the plant. But now I am slowly realizing that that is not always the case, which again, it depends. It's my favorite uh, answer to all plant questions. Um, and that is with fertilizing, if your plant is still experiencing growth, so whether that is new leaves, you can still keep feeding your plant. And so if they have slowed down, that is a different story. So if they're no longer producing leaves, that some of them have gone dormant like alocasia or caladium, things that are bulbous that want to go to sleep, don't feed those because they're trying to conserve their energy and they don't need to be um, like forced to, to grow leaves at that point. So if your plants are still growing, then you can still feed them. Um, of course, my highest, highest of recommendation, even though this is not sponsored whatsoever, is my GT Foliage Focus, which is the best thing that I could ever do for my plants and me. Super simple, um, but yeah, to continue to feed in winter if your plants are still growing.
So let's just think about us in winter is that when it gets colder, our immune systems drop um, and we are more susceptible to getting sick and it's just the same with plants. So as soon as the temperature tends to drop, um, let's say humidity is not quite there, but just like humans, when our environment is not as um, ideal, we definitely get more susceptible to sickness. And the same goes with plants. So whether that is bacterial or a fungal infection. So for me, a bacterial versus fungal infection, I sometimes find a bit hard to determine which one's which, but I'll give you my kind of hint of whether it is actually a fungal or bacterial infection versus whether it's just like a browning or yellowing of a leaf. So, um, so for example, this tenanthi here has brown edges. Um, and you could say that might be underwatering. You might say that could be um, sun exposure and burnt um, direct light. And that might be the case. But you might actually think, is it a bacterial or fungal infection? And the way that I like to go about it is that if there is like a browning or yellowing, oh, sorry, if there is like a browning on the leaf and if there is a yellow ring around it, um, and it kind of actually resides and gets bigger and bigger, um, that's a sign that is a more of like a bacterial or fungal infection rather than um, just like under or over watering. So that's how I go about it. And the biggest thing is that if it grows, so it's not just like brown and it's staying brown, um, it's brown and it's got a yellow rim and it starts to slowly eat at the plant. So what can you do? You can chop off those leaves. I think that's one of the fastest ways to kind of like slow down the infection. Um, but there is a beautiful product that Callum told me about it, Plants by Callum, but originally he heard it from Alicia and Nigel. So Alicia is Wild About Plants and Nigel is Urban Green. So a very big thank you to them for showing me this product because it is amazing. And it may look, um, how do I put this? nuclear but i promise you it's actually um an awesome beautiful product and that is micro kill so micro kill is both for fungal bacterial uh prevention as well as if there is um actually infection uh and then also that um i just realized this but it also looks after rot so i haven't tried it yet in terms of trying to um get rid of rot but it does say it on the bottle, which I totally missed. Um, but the really cool thing about this is even though it looks super toxic, because like, look at that label. Um, <laughs> it looks like it's nuclear. It's actually made from yucca trees as well as um, oranges. It's supposedly like you could eat this thing. This is like food grade stuff. Um, you can clean your house with it. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I love it so much is because it's not super toxic um, and it will do both a barrier. So if you're wanting to, so what I do for the store and even for my plants at home is that I use this guy for both preventative as well if, if there's actually an infestation or um, an infection, sorry. So once a month, I will use micro kill for a preventative and I think that the dose or the concentration is less. And then if there is actually a infection, then I use a higher concentration, which is on the bottle. Um, so really good. And that's what I would use for a bacterial, fungal, and supposedly we can use it for rot, win-win. Let's talk about humidity and temperature. So this one, humidity and temperature actually have a really beautiful relationship where if um, the temperature, so what I like to think of it is that they've got a indirect relationship, whether they're portionate or not, I'm not too sure, but an indirect relationship, which means that when one increases, the other decreases and vice versa is one decreases, the other increases. So the way that I like to think of it is, um, is that if we've got beautiful humidity, uh, let's say it's like 80 or 90% humidity, as soon as you put a light source, um, heat, um, that humidity will actually lower. The relationship here is that because it's winter and the temperature is going to go down, that means humidity is going to be higher. So what I say for this is that during winter, just keep an eye out on your humidity because if we're, to, we're more like the 90 to 100% humidity and we don't have good airflow, that's when bacterial and fungal infection occur. So 
what I say to this is that if your humidity is really high, you can either reduce it if you've got a humidifier um, that you can play with. Otherwise, you can also just add good airflow. So whether that's fans or making sure something, you open it up more regularly. During winter, it's definitely one of the factors you have to think about because of bacterial and fungal infection. Um, you're making a perfect environment for them. And then also that the plants are more susceptible. So keep that in mind. Oh, let's talk about pest management because even if it is winter, it is still a good time to keep on top of your pest management. And while I say, I, I like to say management because I would love to encourage growers and collectors to actually, um, to learn about pests. And because there's probably a, uh, what do you call that? There's probably a thought or perception that you have to annihilate pests. Like there is no more, there is zero. And that is all well and good. But the reality is that if you've got a collection with lots of plants, that um, it's more realistic to think that there is always going to be pests, but you're just managing them. Um, and I can definitely say that I definitely go through seasons as in like when pests are at an all time low um, and I feel like there's nothing there, but then of course it's just a wave. So um, trying to be on top of them is something that I would like to share with you and encourage you to do. Um, whether that is more of like the natural approach, whether you wanna do uh, beneficial insects and things like that, um, Unfortunately, I, I wish I could do beneficial insects. I could probably do it in the greenhouse, which I think they still are in the greenhouse. I can't tell. Um, but I can't necessarily do it in the store. I feel like people might start to freak out if they start to see bugs everywhere. Um, and maybe some people can't decipher what are good um, and beneficial insects versus the bad that they are pests. So anyway, Tangent, but let's talk about management and I'll show you all the things that I like to use. So unfortunately, I do not have the luxury of being able to do more natural methods purely because they don't work fast enough. So this stuff is really quick acting and the beautiful thing, it's kind of like you spray it and forget it. And let me explain why. So for those of you, um, that have seen this before. This is Comfidor, and Comfidor has definitely um, been my go-to in terms of pesticide uh, um, for my personal collection as well as for PCM. Um, unfortunately, this has stopped. And so me and some friends have been looking into what is it, like the same constitute or the same main ingredient. Um, yeah, and we did, we found one. So. While we were up in Cairns, we found this guy, which is Congard. Um, and this is amazing because it's a systemic. And when I say that, systemics um, work a lot better for the plant just because if you were to buy, let's say, a pesticide that more um, is tailored to direct contact with the pest. So let's say that you're spraying a plant and you might just forget a little crevice or underneath the petiole or um, not necessarily behind the leaf. So those ones are direct contact ones. And if you miss a pest, then the pest might not die because it's not um, covered with this pesticide. Whereas a systemic is more like the plant absorbs it. It's in its stream, in its system. Um, you can think of it as it's in its bloodstream. And so even if you don't directly get in contact with the, the bug, the pest, it will munch on the leaf and then it will have it in its system and be a bye-bye. So that's why I really like systemics is that you don't have to necessarily um, get direct contact with the pest. So this guy here is a concentrate. It actually ends up being cheaper than Confidor. So I'm actually very lucky that we found this. Um, and yeah, it is for pretty much everything besides spider mites. So let me rattle it off. You've got like, your aphids, your thrips, your mealybugs, um, white flies, scale, uh, yeah, all of the things that are our normal pressures for indoor plants or uh, aroids. So you're probably wondering, uh, so then what about spider mites? Uh, with spider mites, I haven't found anything that I love. 
Uh, I haven't found a systemic or anything like that, but we use Vitality Plus. Uh, supposedly that's also going out the window and no longer going to be in production. But um, there's also something called Broad Blue Protect, which I have a couple of my friends saying that it's a systemic and it's really good for spider mites and it seems to be working. So I can't recommend it myself, but if anyone were to uh, want to try it, uh, hit me up and let me know how you go. Um, so yes, so I use uh, Congard for pretty much everything besides spider mites, but let me show you my secret weapon. Oh, I should also say that none of this is sponsored. Like they're not paying me to say this. I feel like I should have said that at the beginning. Anyway, so this guy is my absolute favorite product and he's called a bug killer. And so what it is, is that it is the same as Confidor and Congard, but it's in granule form, which means what I do for this is that I will actually sprinkle the granules on top of the plant soil um, and it will start to work as soon as you water the plant. And also it lasts for a, up to, uh, it doesn't say, hold on, it says minimum two months. So this is my favorite because it's kind of like you put it in your soil and then you can literally forget about it. Um, and I use this for a lot of my plant maintenance places, so all the businesses that I look after because I don't necessarily have time um, to be spraying down the whole plant. So putting this into the pots and into the soil is a lot easier. And then once it comes to, let's say the three or four um, month cycle, then I'll put some more on. So it is a brilliant, brilliant, product. I'm a big, big fan. So of course, our annoying fungus gnats uh, tend to come out at this time, especially because it is cold, you water more, organic matter, rot, etc, etc. So my recommendation for that is what I like to call uh, the stanky tan lin drops. Um, and this guy literally has lasted me forever because you only need like one or two drops in your watering can. Um, B, uh, I warn you, it does stank. But um, in terms of fungus gnats, if you've got like a lower infestation, you can just do it like once or twice. Um, and then if you've got bigger infestations, you might have to keep doing it at least once a week until they're gone. But that is what I like. Also, this guy is safe for pets and little humans, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but of course, with pesticides, you definitely need to worry about that. Let's talk about repotting as well. So <laughs> I just did my repot video and yes, it was definitely in winter. But um, with repotting, I would say that if you're up north and you've got beautiful warm temperatures, not as cold as Melbourne, um, by all means go for a repot. Um, for people in Melbourne and in cooler climates during winter, I would highly recommend trying to put it off um, just because the plant is already kind of struggling and you repotting it just adds to the stress. But in saying that, my biggest thing is that if a plant is struggling and it's root bound, then of course, um, use due diligence and take it out and repot it. So try to avoid it, but if you need to do it, then by all means, go for it. So my beautiful friends, that is going to be it for this video. Thank you so, so much for hanging out with me and listening to all of my tips and tricks on what to do for some winter care. Um, as you can see, I am very cold and I'm hoping winter goes quick for me and my plants. Um, in saying that the heater is on, it's actually quite toasty in here, but I am just a very cold human. Um, so thank you again for hanging out with me Feel free to like, subscribe, and even comment down below some of your favorite tips or anything that you would like to ask. Um, until my next video, guys, have a good one, and I hope you stay warm this winter. Bye!